Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from today. My name is John Carroll. I'm the CEO and founder of the Service Council. And welcome to today's in-service podcast series event, uh, a master class in service supply chain. What an important topic, the, the increasing importance of supply chain and disruption that everybody has faced, not only in our consumer lives, but across the business segment in sectors that uh, we, we are focused on. Uh, it's been a significant challenge for organizations to grapple with. And so I'm really, really pleased to be joined today by Oliver Lemansky, the CEO of On Process. A warm welcome to you, Oliver. Thank you very much, John, and good day to you and to everyone else, too. Outstanding. Before we begin, um, today's uh, podcast is available uh, via whatever uh, subscriber uh, you uh, sub subscription you have, I should say. Um, so it will be available post uh, today's podcast. We'll have it uh, available on Spotify, Apple, Overcast, or I think there's eight or so different platforms, depending on your choice of uh, flavor, if you will. So do reference back uh, its availability on those uh, podcast uh, accessible platforms. It's also available on our website. So if you wanted to visit the servicecouncil.com, it is www.servicecouncil.com. The podcast section is uh, in our research library, and uh, all of these uh, recorded sessions are available as a resource that you can share with your colleagues uh, after uh, after today's discussion. And we want to make today's discussion as interactive as possible. I know you're just listening, um, having the opportunity to hear from Oliver and his organization on some of the things that they're doing to empower ser service supply chains. But if you have questions or comments or reactions, we'd love to have you comment in the comment section of today's podcast, and we'll try to get a reaction uh, live here, uh, real time. So uh, please do submit any questions or comments as we go, and uh, we'll try to find time across the journey here. Uh, we'll be together here for an hour to uh, fit in a response uh, or a reaction. So the service supply chain, uh, according to the Service Leaders Agenda Benchmark Survey, which we executed in Q1, this is where we ask service leaders the top macro level challenges they're facing and what investments and priorities are they uh, putting uh, at the forefront of their organization. The number one external force was workforce and talent shortage, right? So obviously we've been hearing a lot about the aging, retiring workforce. We've been hearing a lot about the um, uh, the uh, great recession, uh, the great resignation, I should say, um, and and how those two things are compounding each other with respect to available workforce and talent. The number two external force was supply chain. Mm. So supply chain continues to rise up the service leaders' agenda in terms of those external forces that they're facing. Secondarily, we asked them the area of focus and priority. And the number one area of focus, and it's always three different forces that they're prior prioritizing, whether it's CX initiatives, cost initiatives, or revenue. And over the last four years, it was cost and CX, and they flip-flopped one and two every year with revenue being tertiary. Well, this year, service revenue is number one. And uh, so it, it, it really tells a story of organizations that are emerging from the pandemic and starting to turn their attention away from business continuity and cost reduction efforts, holding on for dear life, to this uh, mindset of growth. And in an adjacent research survey built specifically around service revenue, we asked uh, how are service executives focusing their attention with respect to revenue initiatives? And 85% of service leaders benchmarked indicate that the sale of parts represents 20% or greater of current service revenue. And as we sort of parse out that data, uh, uh, even greater proportion of those respondents attribute um, almost 50% of their profit margin, their service revenue margins to the, the sale of service parts. It's a, it's a tremendous opportunity for revenue growth. And, and with the attention being turned towards revenue growth, uh, it is a, a tremendous opportunity. Now, when we look at uh, recently, we, we benchmarked the frontline agents. The voice of the field service engineer survey is an adjacent research survey we conducted. We asked technicians and engineers, what are the features that you would like if you were to ask management? And the number one response at 40% were spare parts inventory visibility. The number three response at 39% was parts ordering. And the number two, or the uh, number five response, I should say, at 23%, was tech-to-tech -tech transfer of parts. So parts availability is 
often being attributed to as the number one factor that is eroding first time fix rates. So there's a tremendous opportunity for uh, the, the parts disposition and the ability to empower frontline agents with the accessibility of parts to drive not only customer experience, but obviously revenue growth as well as the top focus of service leaders. And so now we're gonna turn our attention towards a master class in service supply chain. We've featured this discussion on many occasions. We had a, a relatable podcast with Alex Cummin, Alex, um, excuse me, Ward from Cummins. He's the executive director of service supply chain at Cummins. And he talked about supply chain disruption and transparency. It was a great discussion. And now we're gonna turn towards a masterclass in service supply chain, welcoming back Oliver Lemansky, the CEO of On Process. Oliver, a quick introduction for today's listening audience, uh, personal, professional background, anything about yourself you want our audience to know? <laughs> Thanks, John. First of all, my compliments on an extremely robust and, and thorough uh, data set which you bring to, to, to the table. I think it, it sets up the conversation really well. Um, John, I'm I'm uh, I'm Oliver Lemansky, as you say. I'm the CEO of On Process. Um, I'm 42 years old. I have three kids. Uh, I'm 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 a Brit, but I found myself as the CEO of the Boston-based company On Process, which is a technology and managed service provider for some of the world's leading um, uh, service organizations. You know, your Cisco's and HP's and and, and Dell EMC's in the in the in the tech space, all the way through to medical devices. So uh, radiotherapy companies like Varian, Electa, and also wearables uh, like Philips Lifeline, through to the um, communications B two C sort of space, and um, um, uh, companies like uh, Verizon, AT and T, Comcast. These companies all rely on on process to manage various aspects of their ser service supply chain, so being able to get inventory to and from their customers um, in uh, in the best possible way. That's wonderful. That's that's wonderful, Oliver. Let's talk a little bit about the, the the impact that your organization is making for some of these brands that you just referenced, which is an impressive lineup, if you will. So the relationship is is quite important and impactful with respect to parts disposition, um, uh, both to and from, if you will, uh, in terms of forward and returns logistics, and that whole circular process, if you will. Can you talk a little bit about the impact that you're making within your customers? I can. I mean, if you, if you, you, you set up the conversation well, this is the service supply chain has gone from um, being something which is in the shadows. You know, 20 years, I, I spent 20 years in this industry, starting in, um, in, in um, uh, warranty spare parts around the mobile phone industry in the early 2000s and through to understanding how um, sort of last mile two and four hour distribution networks work in, in, um, uh, in, in the service engineer space. Um, and now on process, I've been here for the last few years. And I think one of the, if I look at the, the journey of people along the last, say, in the 20 years that I can comment from firsthand experience, we have gone from an industry where we have been referred to as, for example, aftermarket or after sales service, um, or even perhaps afterthought. <laughs> uh, because, you know, rarely front um, at the center of attention when it comes to uh, new IT roadmaps or investments or spends. Um, but now take a step back. Look at look at the kind of data you just read out. Um, you know the service supply chain. We live in a in a service economy. Um, companies are making all of their big their traditional manufacturers a switch from making their profits from selling bits of kit um, to uh, providing the service and the promise of uptime. Whether or not um, you know people are consuming that as a as a device in a hospital or as data from a data farm or whatever it might be, or connected home or mobile device or even cars these days. We live in a service economy. Um, so if you look then at the supply chain that powers that service economy and you look at the power that on process as a, as a managed service provider and technology provider can, can offer in that space, you know, you have to follow that, that, that curvature of, of, of this becoming an industry, which has had, which has had to evolve very rapidly. Um, and as such, a lot of the, um, traditionally the, the clients that we, that we've been working with have, um, have had very disparate data systems, uh, disparate, uh, you know, technology and operations and vendor management um, styles providing support to what is now an extremely profitable and revenue generating machine for their organization. Um, so our process is there to help our customers drive that digital transformation and be able to unlock cost savings opportunities, improve the, 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 yeah, the, the customer 
service experience and also to, to drive sustainability measures for our customers. Um, it was interesting on the, some of the data that you read out. I was, um, I was sort of waiting to hear the sustainability was coming in towards the top as well, because we are starting to see a flip from people making decisions based on um, how they manage their um, service supply chains from cost saving um, and uh, customer service experience. You know, and then much later down the down the road, it being about sustainability to so sustainability, taking much, 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 much more of a front seat in the types of decisions that people are making. And I'll talk, uh, I hope later, perhaps I can talk a little bit more about how tangibly, you know, on process as a company can help drive uh, and empower our customers to do just that. Yeah, that's a great point you make, not, not only in terms of parts disp disposition, sustainability, um, factors in terms of uh, recyclability, uh, you know, are you recycling, where, where do parts go in terms of end of life, but also the supply chain network that you build, how are they, what are the, the, the business fundamentals that they're deploying, yeah. are they a sustainable company, are they using sustainable practices, and it's becoming more and more important in terms of the partnership networks that you, that you maintain, uh, the importance of sustainability across those networks as well. Kim, 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 and we'll come. We will circle back to sustainability. I, I believe it's one of the most important topics of our generation, and I think it it, it deserves some more time. Can we can we shift gears uh, a little bit around service supply chain? It's a little bit different than general supply chain, isn't it? Can can you frame a little bit of the differences, the core differences? Yeah, I, I mean, I I think I, I, a lot of the practices which work in general supply chain sometimes struggle to make impact a lot of the decisions that can be made in general supply chain whether or not it's around planning where inventory is or how you can get in, uh, inventory to your customers whether or not that customer is a direct end customer a business a consumer a field engineer and then also the the critical you know ability to be able to get stuff back again uh, that's not a retail environment or it's rarely a retail environment it's a service environment um, often the, the the ownership of of the inventory itself is retained by the service provider, and the customer is just um, uh, has has inventory on site to be able to continue to 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 um, receive the the services that they're paying for, which means that there are many complexities that don't exist in more traditional supply chains. For example, um, the ability to continue to know where you, if it's an install base that you're managing as part of your service um, uh, network to understand. Um, where that install base is, um, what are the service levels um, that are attached to that that are being contractually sold to customers, um, to understand what succession planning and upgrade opportunities there might be from there, and then to understand um, how within that service level contract, um, how you can best fulfill that customer. So, for example, it's great if your sales team goes out and makes uh, new initiatives, new inroads into a new market, let's say, um, let's say the Middle East, and they start selling new infrastructure, new equipment, new service contracts into the Middle East. But if they sell that with a very tight service contract, the, the, the service supply chain organization then needs to be able to supply uh, inventory to those customers within that supply chain. And that goes with all of the complexities of being able to get stuff through borders, set up new stocking locations, and then make sure that you have the right levels of stock to be able to supply those customers. And then, of course, you have to switch gears and provide everything in reverse again, which is the re reverse logistics or the returns world. You know, you see many CEOs out on in, 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 in the street state making excellent pledges around sustainability and being able to get things back and to mine e-waste and not just um, always manufacture and buy new parts. But to do that, you have to have a supply chain that works in both directions, forward to the customers and back again. Um, and I, in my 20 years, or yeah, it's 20 years this year, actually, in, in this industry, I have never seen, um, for example, a reverse supply chain, one size fits all. You and anyone with a lean or Six Sigma background will know that if you have up to 7 billion starting points for a, for a process, in this case, anyone can be a returns um, uh, start point, um, and 7 billion, I mean, it's around about the world's population. You can't have, you can't train everyone how, you know, what the perfect process looks like. It has to be intuitive. Um, it has to be modern. It has to be training free. And therefore, if you, if, if your pool of knowledge that you go to learn about is traditional supply chain, going through retail, going through whatever it might be, the Amazon experience, there are lessons to be learned. And there are, especially in, in, for example, like the Amazon experience, some very disruptive lessons that can be learned. The traditional supply chain, service supply chain world, and all the service contracts that go with it create complexity. And that create, creates challenges, but it also creates opportunities. 
Yeah, you, you, you bring up a lot of good points there, Oliver. And one of the things that you bring up is this whole SLA commitment and the penalties that come associated with, with many of those written SLAs that predated the pandemic and all these supply chain disruptions that we've been going through and, and, and how challenged it has been uh, in terms of service delivery because of, in many respects, parts availability. And, and we've heard uh, organizations embracing a, a, a borrowing methodology for parts in, in terms of refurbished versus new and, and then managing the process of exchange. And that's been something that uh, we've seen on the rise in terms of yeah. um, uh, the, the whole availability of parts and the shortage of parts. And it circles back actually to the voice of the field service engineer survey data that I reviewed, which is the number three area uh, that uh, technicians are looking for is tech to tech transfer of parts. So yeah. if you can't provide me visibility uh, and if I can't order them, then can I beg, borrow and steal from my counterpart over here to still manage the, the customer experience? So I, that's, I, I yeah. think that's right. And I think, you know, there is obviously the lag effect of the uh, initial supply chain shortages that were created during the um, pandemic. Um, that bullwhip effect has been, has had significant impacts across certainly our customers in the wider and the wider service market. And then of course, we're now getting a double bullwick effect because now there's the impact of everything that's happening in Russia and Ukraine in that terrible situation, which creates further supply chain um, um, uh, challenges. And these things together, then you turn around to the, you go back to those service customer, um, sorry, the customer service contracts that we just talked about and the SLAs that sit within them. And, you know, service engineers or, or, or supply chain organizations will be as um as entrepreneurial entre entrepreneurial as they need to be to try and find ways to as you say beg borrow and steal to, in order to make these events um successful and the same applies to exec level decisions being made in the service supply chain we have examples of some of our customers spending almost entire annual budgets up front uh, in order to try and whenever they can um, purchase certain levels of stock and, and overflow the market thinking about the unreliability of the marketplace coming up ahead. And these are decisions which um, at the beginning of the pandemic, those that made those decisions turned out to be very well advised decisions because then you know, everything started to slow down. But those are fireable offenses if you get them wrong. And the same applies the other way around. If you, if you chose to go with the, um, you know, this is what we do, I'll follow the processes, you would most likely have found yourself in supply chain shortages and being facing other decisions. So there's a huge amount of flux and change which is happening in the marketplace. And uh, hopefully on prices are there to help uh, steer some of our customers and <laughs> through some of the challenges they face. I know I've, I've felt a little bit of that over uh, stocking methodology that you reference in my personal life. You know, the, 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 the emphasis of, of price gouging online in terms of availability of something that I wanted. It, and this was right smack dab in the middle of the pandemic where I, uh, fitness gyms were not open. So I was trying to buy a set of dumbbells just to keep myself relatively uh, fit here. And um, the, the price gouging was just remarkable on a, a set of dumbbells, for example. So I, I've um, seen it personal. So like that, uh, that overstocking emphasis that you talk about, it does drive a, a, a pricing um, uh, sort of margin uh, impact down to the end consumer, if, if you will. Can you can you tell us a little bit more? Any other noteworthy supply chain uh, supply chain trends that you're hearing from customers? Whether it's you know we talked about sustainability, um, agility, and transparency. Those have been common fra phrases that we've heard. What does that yeah. mean to you? Well, I, I think those are those relevant. I think I think um, sustainability and, and visibility. Let, let's go one level deeper. There, I think we're, I think it all starts with data. Um, and if you look at trends. If you look at the underlying cause of, of so many of the issues that were found is that um, when these um, supply chain shortages started to bite and take effect, is that um, a lot of the industry found that they couldn't rely on the information that they were looking at. They didn't know necessarily where their inventories were or whether or not customers really were um, receiving the inventory they should, should have been or they weren't, or they were, you know, the world of controllable versus uncontrollable failure when kind of completely out of the window. Um, and that created a lot of um, desire to double down on understanding data in the service supply chain. Now, this is very interesting because if you look at, if you imagine the, the town of service, um, I think you and I spoke about this once over at lunch in Boston, John. 
Yeah. Um, and if you imagine the, the the industry of service being a town, um, the, you know, there's there's a huge amount of investment that has gone into this town, a huge number of interested parties coming over the hills towards the people that have been in this industry. And you can see that from um, the likes of massive tech players, whether or not it's Microsoft or Oracle or Salesforce, uh, and I'm sure there are many others out there that I haven't mentioned, or whether or not it's you know, big tech companies that have started in this industry, so the likes of ServiceMax or ServiceNow or others, as well as the big um, investment funds of Francisco Partners and um, Summit and, 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 and Polaris, and I'm sure many, Silver Lake and many others, investing into this industry because that understanding of where are those service customers um, who are revenue generators, um, what are the service contracts that they have, and how do you fulfill them with their, with their service needs is a growing need in a service um, economy. Um, so if you look at that and talk about what are the tech top supply chain trends, it's linked to that. It's linked to understanding where are your customers, what are the decisions that you can make, um, how can you disrupt some of these traditional measures which have proved to be um, uh, not not any more fit for the world and the very you know sort of undulating uh, environments that we currently find up you know find for our, find ourselves in. People want more visibility. They want more agility. They want to be seen as more sustainable. They want their customer satisfaction to improve, and that means changing the way they do business. Um, so I think those supply chain trends are very interesting. They're extremely um, well funded, both from a technology standpoint, the companies I just mentioned, as well as, I mean, you know, think to take some of the companies that I mentioned at the start of this, who are our customers, and there are many others that are, you know, aren't our customers. Um, if you look at the, you know, the as you say, this, this is where their revenue is coming from. This is where their um, yeah. uh, cost base is, is being defined by and therefore how their profits are being generated. It's it's an extremely sort of, um, yet, yet for some reason, you know, many of the analysts that are in this space don't even have a quadrant uh, for what we're talking about today. So it's it sits there as this sort of, uh, you know, un, untalked about secret, if you will, this need to be able to get inventory to and from service customers. Um, so there, are, I think, I don't think I've answered your question very well, but I, I think these trends are very deep and very data related and very rapidly evolving. Uh, absolutely, uh, no doubt about it. One of the other trends that we've been tracking across the entire service uh, industry is the topic of mental health and 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 wellness and and burnout and. Yeah. And and that's certainly frontline agent oriented. Um, we're we're in the middle of our voice of the field service engineer survey, and certainly technicians and engineers have been uh, very strained and challenged in terms of that burnout. But that also extends to the supply chain world. And we've heard you know twenty four seven operations and you know all of the the challenges that come along with managing workforces in a in an always on met methodology with with which today's supply chain requires uh, has been uh, a cause of burnout as well. Have you been hearing a little bit about that from your, your customers? I have, and I think, I think that some of those tactics are um, very relevant tactics to be able to, um, well, provide exactly that tactical response to a challenge. I think if you look at the, the ongoing more long, mid to long-term solution for some of the underlying causes of those challenges, um, it starts with people being able to resolve their data issues and get a much stronger footing in understanding um, all the different you know, data elements that the, together represent an accurate picture of what's happening in their service supply chain, what's happening with their service customers, what's happening with their field engineer workforce, where are their inventory, what are their options? So that you know, when these um, uh, leaders in these spaces are thinking about different uh, levers or levers, depending on where you are in the world, um, that you can pull, um, that there is actually something meaningful attached to that control mechanism um, other than work harder, work through the night, update me at any time, here's my cell phone number. Um, and that's not, that's, that's, that's not a unicorn, right? That's not a silver bullet. That's not an overnight switch. That's a, a, a journey that people need to make a decision to go on, uh, get alignment from, you know, different people around them internally and externally and then embark on that mission and I think I think uh, as I say I think it is evolving very very rapidly I think you know both of the delay events and the 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 you know the, the global pandemic and also what's happening at the moment um, Russia and Ukraine have both created a sense of huge sense of urgency towards 
towards companies and leaders being able to get a better understanding of what they can do to cope with variants in the supply chain, in this case, the service supply chain. Yeah, another way, as we segue here, uh, another way to talk about variants and managing against the variants is is building resiliency into the, into the supply chain, a really important topic. We've heard a lot from member organizations, the importance of building an infrastructure that's resilient uh, from, from many different angles, whether it's um, uh, uh, backup to your partner network, uh, established uh, uh, backup support, whether it's uh, the, the transition of data into and out of the supply chain, you, you talked about the importance of data, um, the, uh, the inventory levels and thresholds that you're talking about, uh, having the ability to combat shortages in terms of parts availability. Uh, those are some of the measures that we're hearing in terms of framing a resilient infrastructure. What does resiliency mean to you, Oliver? Well, I think those mechanisms are all very relevant. I think there are other ones as well. I mean. It, it, you know, how far do you go with the disruptive sort of mindset around how you manage it? So um, many organizations will sign large uh, contracts with um, you know, the world's leading um, transport integrators, which are great companies. I used to work for one myself. Um, but that does mean then that, for example, when a service event happens in terms of you know, resiliency, you, you, need, you, you are contractually obliged to have to use their, con uh, their network. Whereas, you know, uh, there are many great um, technologies available today on, on process agora is one um, where you can automatically find many different transport options available which could include crowdsourced ways of getting you know or, or uber or whatever it might be or um you know to be able to, to be able to get deliveries in that last mile transport event in in case your your more traditional supply chain model fails now to do that or something like that you need to go all the way back to your vendor contracts and your vendor management um uh, which is a, is a almost political conversation often within companies at the, at the at the level of relationships that they have so i think resiliency you know it also goes back to you know as you say it's talking about inventory levels and talking about um uh, supplier sourcing mechanisms um uh and also perhaps maybe even around there's a big variance in different verticals between um, reutilization of existing um, uh, inventory. Uh, so, for example, it's been commonplace for a long time in the technology industry, both B2B and B2C, to be able to um, uh, harvest um, you know, defective products or, or unused or, um, um, you know, um, uh, I've just got acronyms flying through my mind. I don't want to use acronyms. <laughs> or, or no fault found parts coming back from service events, being able to harvest those um, send them through the relevant repair networks, refurbishment networks, and be able to reutilize. Now, anyone in the in the tech space is going to be listening to me saying, yeah, but we've been doing that for years. In the medical device space, that's not commonplace. It's, it's still a growing world because there are many different reasons for that. For example, in radiotherapy, there may be various radioactive elements to, to the technology which is employed. But there are also many elements to the, to the technologies which are not radioactive, which, which can be re reutilized. Same in imaging and same in um, many other many other techs. So I think, you know, being able, but again, being able to to engage those levers or levers, being able to say, right, we're going to turn up reutilization. That means that you need to turn up your repair mechanism, you, your your repair costs. You need to be pretty sure that you're going to reutilize that stuff. Otherwise, you're going to end up with a load of stuff either gathering dust in in, in warehouses, or or paying repair vendors a lot of money that you don't need to repair them. Uh, which means connecting your your supply chain mechanisms in the field with how you get parts to your customers, how you get them back, connecting them with your planning mechanisms um, to be able, um, once again, we find ourselves back in the digital story of being able to connect data and make smarter decisions across the, the your organization that gives you more resiliency to be able to cope with variations. And again, it won't be it won't be the silver bullet, it won't be the unicorn, it's not gonna fix everything, but it will give you a huge amount more information and options to make smarter decisions for than traditional one size fits on. This system connects with this system, then it goes to that transport provider, hopefully it gets to the customer and then later we'll deal with the returns. I love the I love the discussion around parts disposition and basically utilizing every resource that is accessible to you, um, the truck stock inventory, the uh, components that come back from customers for refurbishment or, or recycling, 
uh, all of these become resources to build into a, a resilient service supply chain with uh, in 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 combat against uh, the availability of parts in, in the supply chain, right? So it yeah. becomes part of the the problem solving opportunity for for service and supply chain leaders. I, I love the love the discussion around parts disposition because there's there's a gold mine uh, of opportunity um, when you think about the impact it has on customer experience and delivery, and then its contribution to revenue, as we had talked about uh, the importance earlier in the discussion with some of the research data. Can, can you give us one to two examples, Oliver, of uh, leaders or organizations that have been able to successfully manage against these trends? You, you've got many customers that are doing many, many great things. Any, any uh, customer examples that you think are noteworthy for our listening audience? Yeah. Um... And uh, yes, I do. Um, I, I would, and 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 in mentioning them, I do so as uh, by 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 meaning or offering a compliment to them as an organisation. Uh, just in case, in case <laughs> and I hope they are listening. Um, one would be, um, well, perhaps perhaps before we talk about the names of the organisation, talk about the, what they had in common as well, um, because I think what they had in common was a desire, first of all, a, a, um, a very clear right to the top. Um, desire to change and a very clear understanding of the mission that they wanted to go on. Um, and then if I think about companies like HB Enterprise Point Next, um, where they um, and, and are very well um, uh, publicized as well in, in various different um, uh, uh, magazines and, and digital um, things that people can find online, they, really, they have a fantastic initiative to be able to globalize, digitize and standardize their uh, many aspects of their service supply, uh, service supply chain, starting with their recovery and being able to, um, regardless of whether or not you are a direct end customer or a field engineer or a channel partner, whatever it is, be able to, or, and, and regardless of whether or not you're in uh, Australia, China, uh, Mexico or the US or anywhere in between, being able to, at a very simple glance at your at your phone or whatever, be able to identify what needed to be returned and have a really simple mechanism to return it, which includes, for example, as you say, being able to say, I'm going to give it to a different tech or I'm going to leave it in a locker or I'm going to drop it off at a, at a, at a FedEx store, or whatever whatever it might be, or or I need, I would like to send it back or, or whatever. And, um, and, and they chose to go through this global transformation starting in March 2020, which is around about exactly the same time that COVID hit. Um, and they managed to successfully deploy it to over 110 cu countries by the end of that year. Um, and they did so obviously without anyone getting on airplanes or anything like that, um, which led to all types of accolades, both internally and externally, completely uh, justified. We were proud to be their technology provider for that um, and, and a managed services provider. But it was it was very much them who, who led that um, journey internally and a huge amount of of um, and that what it also meant is that the CEO Antonio can go out onto the street, or the CEO of uh, Point Next, that um, uh, pretty um, can go out and they can talk about you know being able to go out and get global returns from their customers anywhere in the world and be able to drive sustainability uh, models based on reducing e waste, knowing full well that anywhere in the world anyone can touch um, you know can pick up their device, touch some touch some buttons, and be able to get stuff back. Um, I think that's a, that's a superb example of using tech and um, an internal, very well executed internal internal uh, transformation um, project to drive what I would call digital transformation. I think it's fantastic um, and hitting some really strong, um, um, uh, you know, internal touch points. There are, um, does that one make sense to you? Does that, is that? That's certainly does. Yeah, very much resonates. Did, did you have another one that you wanted to share? I did, I, I, I hesitate to, to, to say who they are, but I mean, I really want to mainly just to give them um, recognition, but again, they're another one of our clients who's a big um, French uh, tech-based firm who have gone, who are much earlier on the journey, uh, yeah. but who have a recognition that they want to drive uh, what's internally called supply chain excellence across their uh, service organization. They are an entire services business. The whole thing is a services business. Um, and they are in the process of driving digitization across the way that they plan, deliver, and recover um, inventory to and from their, their customers, uh, including new installations. and and the way that they culturally are going about adopting this um, and driving that transformation, which is as much about the mindset and the culture of that transformation as it is about whatever technology you end up putting in, 
um, uh, and, and putting some really great minds around the world. Um, and you know, we're working with them you know, all over the place. I, mean, I, I, I failed to mention at the beginning, I mean, On Process is a company, we're Boston based, but we're, there are a lot of people in India and in Costa Rica and Bulgaria and, and the UK and the Netherlands. So we, we're working with these people across countries and yes, now travel starting to come back in so people can start to build those relationships face to face. But so much of this fantastic transformation is happening digitally um, without people having to, to, to get on planes, which drives even more of a sustainability story. So anyway, I, there are some, and there are so many companies out there driving and not talking about this stuff at conferences that we are, we are just transformation after transformation and transformation. And I urge service leaders out there, if you aren't already on top of looking at the way that you're transforming your service supply chain, um, do so, do so urgently, whether I use on process or anyone else to do it, I, I really urge people to, 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 to look at the new ways of, uh, and, and tools and technology that's available in the marketplace. Let, let's continue on that digital transformation thread, because um, uh, one of the things that we've been looking at as a trend um, is, well, digital transformation, of course, right? It's been the hot topic here for the last several years. But uh, an area that has been sort of popping up with respect to our members is there's been a lot of modernization, but there hasn't been true digital transformation, threading the digital technologies together, eliminating the silos in between all of these digital technologies that exist in pockets, if you will. Um, and I'm not sure if you're seeing a little bit of that uh, with respect to the connection of all the different technologies that are being deployed, whether it's workforce management oriented, parts you know, distribution oriented, bringing these things together for a single pane of glass, if you will. A any comments on, on that emerging trend, um, sort of eliminating that modernization and, and creating that true, true digital transformation? Yeah, I think, yeah, and I think the digital transformation, which is talked about so often, uh, is as much perhaps more about, as I say, about the the culture of embarking on on looking at disruptive ways of, of using data to drive new ways of doing business, including looking at your revenue model and your cost model to open up new opportunities. Um, I, um, um, I <laughs> there's a, a wonderful episode of... Um, I actually, I was in a meeting the other day and I told this story and I, and I thought it was The Simpsons, but it wasn't. I went back and looked. It was 30 Rock. And there's a 30 Rock episode where um, um, I, I think um, one of the characters gets his team and they try to you know, use a bunch of writers from a comedy show to reinvent the microwave oven um, because that's what you know, the, 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 real, the real person wants. And they end up putting wheels on it so it goes across the countertop and they end up putting cup holders on it. And, and then they come back and then it sort of cuts away and they come back and they've accidentally reinvented the car um, without, without meaning to. And, it's, and the reason I say that is because if you're not careful with the digital transformation stuff, you end up saying, well, we want digital transformation. We'll take one system and we'll bolt on this and this and this and this and this. And before you know it, you've tried to re-engineer an ERP system, a planning system, a, a, a workforce management system, your, your, you know, your, your field engineer scheduling system, your dispatch system, and, and you've gone cross-eyed because you've, you've just rebuilt the car or perhaps even the Death Star. Um, so I think digital transformation done effectively is when is when uh, you're able to bring together best and breed technologies to be able to, uh, towards a common goal. And that common goal really has got to come from within in a company, a desire to, to hit certain, you know, you talked at the start about those big touch points, whether or not it's about service revenue or about, you know, cost saving initiatives or about sustainability, really clear goals that people say, we're not digitizing for digitizing sake. We're going on digital transformation because we want to hit the following numbers for the following um, pledge, a sustainability pledge by this year. And here are the, here's the different tech that's going to help us get us along the way. The tech won't do it alone. It's the people that are within the, in the leadership organizations that within those companies that are going to be the ones that either get to climb to the summit of those mountains and call a cool victory or, or, you know, or, 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 or struggle along the way. So I think that you know, that, you know, we we very much look at the tech that we build. We're not trying to build tech in, in other people's space. We're trying to build some of the tech that's a missing gap and bring in and advise our introduce our clients to other best and breed tech providers to be able to remove the silos that have really restricted being able to make effective decisions across the service supply chain, so that leaders can make decisions against service revenue goals or against cost saving goals or against sustainability goals without having to 
to, to go on a three year long, you know, ERP rebuild, um, you know, and take a ticket in the queue and and then hope that your your job's still there at the end of it. Um, because you can do stuff really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. It just, I think that digital transformation goal is going to be different for every company that goes along the way. On process, aside from what we're talking about today in service supply chain, we went through our own digital journey uh, over the last two years, which, which you know, we, we which, which, well, we were very successful with. But that included changing all of the technology around uh, and the processes around how we're driving our HR function, our finance function, our sales function, our marketing function our workforce management function for the 1300 or so people that are within our company, you know, and we, um, and that drove a lot of change that meant organization changes, it meant new jobs, it meant new, new, new talent, it meant training existing talent. And that's as much of a cultural journey than it is any one software vendor coming into our, through our doors and saying, here you are, Oliver, buy this software. Um, and, and you're, you know, Monday on Monday, you can just, I don't know, go and go, sailing or something i mean that's just not it's not realistic you know so you're i really encourage people to think where we have seen the most success is when you're able to, to create an environment a collaborative environment where you can bring in those types of best and breed technologies does that make sense john it certainly does yeah yeah no I, I love that organizational preparedness the ability to integrate technology into functional roadmaps the connection between technical and functional roadmaps all these things become really important uh, collaboration amongst service and other parts of the organization. These are some of the inhibitors that we're hearing in terms of true digital transformation, achieving it. Right. Um, so I, I think you highlight a lot of really, really uh, poignant uh, thoughts there. I think that's great. And, and my compliments towards you as well, John, because you've put together the tech advisory board within the service council, which brings together a lot of leaders. And I'm, I'm, I'm honored that you invited me to join that um in that space right and and, and to, for us to be able to have these types of conversations of talking about well how available is is the data that we each have in our different tech environments to be able to solve you know wider problems for our customers you know we you know it would be very unlikely that any even just from a procurement standpoint big companies would go completely solo um uh, supplier on, on on something as important as their as their own service pnl and their service revenue uh, and their profitability. So us being able to understand where we can work together and how we can frame that in a non, um, you know, in, in a sort of safe, non-competitive environment of us saying, hey, listen, we've all got a certain number of dollars to be able to spend on R&D and to be able to think about where can we, you know, um, go into brainstorming mode and get clever analytics people and data mining people to start looking at decision making and do that in a, in, 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 in a way that, um, that we understand that we're looking at different decisions that we can solve for our customers. And I think your service council, the advisory board on, on the service council is a great example of that. And, and we're honored to have you, Oliver. It's been, your, your contributions have been many in a very short term. We launched that in, in December. We've always yeah. been a, a platform for the discussion to be led by service executives. Um, we thought it was really important to go to the other side of the equation, who is enabling many of those service initiatives and that being our technology uh, provider community. And so uh, a really important endeavor for us and um, and uh, definitely appreciate and are honored to have you on that board. Let, let's shift gears, but before we stay on business discussion, uh, you, you mentioned uh, 30 Rock and the sitcom and the microwave example, which was really uh, uh, appropriate. Um, Ricky Gervais or Steve Carell, The Office, being a Brit? So I'm... I'm controversially going to say Steve Carell, and that's because Ricky Gervais, I, I know, I, Ricky Gervais, I think is a genius and um, he's amazing. I just, I find it difficult to watch. It's so awkward. I find it difficult to watch because he's so brilliant as that character, whereas Steve Carell, I, I, I find that I can kind of laugh um, at him easier. I just want to hide under my table when I watch the Ricky Gervais one. Like, please don't say it. Please. And then he says it. You're like, no. <laughs> I, I, so, so yeah, I'm, um, yeah. I'm, uh, and you? Which one? He, he's certainly uh, pretty controversial. He's so funny, uh, but very controversial. Uh, sometimes borderline. Um, and so uh, that's that's the only thing that I would comment on. I, I think they're both brilliant. They do such a tremendous job in the show. So did you ever see? And we probably should be back. But did you ever see when um, Ricky Gervais introduced uh, Steve Carell onto the? Uh, I can't remember which award ceremony it was. The Golden Globes, I think it was. When he <laughs> 
<laughs> to everyone, I would recommend Googling that or whatever search engine. And uh, it, it's amusing. <laughs> it it really is. Yeah, he's done a he's done a great job being the awards uh, host. Uh, in terms of you know, this is my fifth time. They've they've welcomed me back five times. I don't know why. And and uh, he's just a, a riot. So, um, all right, let's circle back on topic. So uh, okay, supply chain. We've talked about a number of things. We've talked about resiliency, transparency. We've talked about sustainability, digital transformation. You know, moving from modernization to digital transformation. I, I want to circle back around to the topic of sustainability. Um, we're hearing more and more. Um, service leaders are, are actually being measured um, in terms of compensation around sustainability initiatives. Um, and, and that is starting to um, be more and more commonplace moving forward in terms of achieving certain uh, milestones in terms of how sustainable they are as an organization. Mm -hmm. um, in my experience on process and its impact on circular economy, sustainability is, is right at the heart and core of, of what you do as a, as, as a mission. Tell me a little bit from that, from your perspective. What what does it mean? How far does it reach within on process in terms of an organization? The importance of sustainability. Yeah, I, well, within our organization, we um, the way that we through we view sustainability is in, is in three um, three categories. Number one, what can we do as an, as as individual people and as employees of the company? So whether or not that's us still thinking about our own. Um, you know, uh, carbon footprint or recycling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the second thing is about um, what we can do for our customers. So, um, you know, we move about 24 million um, um, transactions every year, either getting uh, inventory to our customers or a turn of back again. And this in, in a circular service supply chain. So we have an opportunity to be able to, and there are customers' transactions. They're not our transactions, there are customers' transactions. But our customers rely on us to make smart decisions about those transactions. Should we send them? Should we not send them? Is there a smart way of sending them? Is this thing going to come back no fault found? Is there no reason to send it out in the first place? Should we be sending, getting stuff back to a central point? Should we not be sending it back? Should we um, have a certificate of scrap locally if there's no reason to return it? Is there hazardous waste, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the third one is around um, how we can help influence um, policies and, and local communities and, and, and guidance on it. And I would put us in what I would put us on a learning journey. So I and I hope that lots of people are on a learning journey. We're very much on our learning journey in this space. Um, our mission as a company is to power the world's circular service supply chains. So it's in our mission statement. Uh, we have Casper uh, um, uh, von Daniels has, has recently joined us as our head of sustainability. Um, it's great to have him on the team, uh, and we have a very clear way of looking at it. Um, but I really want to frame it as you know we we are on a learning journey, and we understand that we have a role to play, particularly in the second one of those character uh, of those categories, because we can make such a high impact. But for example, and, and I'm focusing on the on the material side of, of sustainability here, right? And a, and a circular um, circularity. There's obviously an employment side of that, which we take very seriously. But I'd like to focus this conversation, if, if we can, on the on the wider industry focus around, for example, e-waste. Um, and we're we're spending a lot of cycles at the moment looking at different ways to measure and manage um, service supply chains based on sustainability. Now that might sound like gobbledygook, um, but like, let's take three different measures, for example. You could measure the impact of your service supply chain by um, carbon. So let's imagine a triangle. One, one, at one point of the triangle says carbon. Carbon is how much, you can measure that by a variety of ways. One way, way that you can measure it is how much transport um, uh, um, uh, fuel you're burning in your, in your service supply chain, both getting parts to and from and moving them around. Your your, uh, your 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 supply chain. Second point on that triangle could be mass. So carbon's one, mass is another. So what's, for example, the tonnage of e-waste that you want to avoid or 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 to improve upon as an organisation? Um, and the third one might be value. Uh, the third one of those points is value. So for example, you could offset your new buy. So you're going to buy you know, X percent or X millions or X tens or hundreds of millions less dollars or, or, or you know, pounds or euros or whatever currency you're in, less new buy by, by being able to reutilize materials and get them through the supply chain back again. Now, the, the reason that I put them at three different points on a, on a, on a, on a triangle, John, is because 
your decision, if you're a leader of one of those supply chain organizations, your decision about where you want to put yourself on that isn't the same for everyone. So for example, if you want to minimize carbon, then getting every single part back again, back from the field is going to be a negative impact on that because you're going to create increased carbon burn. And I'm simplifying this just for the sake of, mm. of the conversation, mm -hmm. right? So then if your CEO goes onto Wall Street or wherever they're, you know, they're listed and says, we're going to get back 100% of our branded materials back from the customers. Okay, that's great. That'll drive an improvement in the mass and potentially in the value categories, but it might have a carbon offset um, that needs to be thought about. So there's no, in, in starting to think about what sustainability looks like in our service economy, that we, all, we are all living in and that on process is proud to be a, you know, a, a, a technology and managed services provider for, we, we need to make sure that we understand how we can frame these discussions, put measurements in place that people can access and say, yes, that's, that's right, that's, that's what we want to do, and then be able to take actions against it. And then if you go back, for example, to the HPE example of, of, of well thought out um, projects and implementation, that had, and I, I won't go into what the targets were, but very clear targets set about why they were doing this particular initiative. Um, and we're in that conversation now with many, many, many of our customers. Um, and increasingly, and I mean really increasingly, almost exponentially sort of um, in terms of speed, if I go back two years ago versus now, how many companies are looking, as you said, to make decisions within their supply chain based on an understanding of, of their sustainability goals is just hugely transformational. So we and other members of, um, of, of, this, um, uh, of this little town called Service have an obligation, I think, to be on that learning path, to think about what sustainability can look like for our customers, to put accurate measurements in place, to be able to get the data, to be able to make those measurements real, and then to be able to put in, um, decisions on, on, on a table for our customers accessible through a pane of glass to our customers to say, what would you like to do? Where would you like to drive that improvement? And I think that that, as I say, we are on a learning curve. We're investing a huge amount of, of our own resources into understanding this. Um, and I encourage others to, to come on that journey with us. That's outstanding. I, I love it. Yeah, it, it, we believe it. The sustainability is one of the most important topics of our generation and, and, and um, we're going to be covering it with much more cadence uh, moving forward. So I will look forward to welcoming you into the discussion uh, with your expertise as, as well as Casper. Um, let, let's let's move back to um, you're serving as a service council technology advisory board member. Tell, tell me a little bit about the value you're getting out of that affiliation. Um, I, I, you know, we, we touched upon this. I, I think that it's a great environment where um, it, it, a good example of the type of environment that I said was so healthy, where where different leaders from a, um, a vendor for a technology development, you know, if you add together all the R and D budgets of those of the of the, and I, anyone listening to this, please, John, I hope you don't mind the 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 the, the plug. Please go onto John's website, onto the Service Council website, have a look at the Technology Advisory Board, and look at the name, look at the companies that. That, they, that we represent, and then think about what the total R and but R and D budgets for um, behind those organisations would add up to, and then think about the decision making power that that could unleash within the service arena. That's what it brings, right? That's what it brings—the ability for us to get together and have those types of conversations. And obviously, we're all we're all influenced by our own customer advisory boards and and our own customers and look in and our own strategy. Um, and, and market assessments, but I think your advisory board is a great place for us to come together. And I really look forward to the first face-to-face -face one of those coming up at your uh, at your event in September in Chicago. Yeah, we're looking forward to it too. It's going to be great, and it feels normal again uh, in terms of coming back together in person. Last year. Uh, we we offered a hybrid environment. Um, we live streamed our main keynotes and and had our audience on hand. We had about 150 attendees last year. Uh, this year, we're projecting well north of that back to normal numbers. So 250 plus uh, industry practitioners and and uh, thank you to On Process for your support as a partnering sponsor. And, and Oliver, you'll join us on, on Monday for our private board discussion with uh, the rest of our board from both technology and industry. So really excited to mingle those two boards together. I think it'll be a, a good set of outcomes that we uh, co-create together coming from that discussion. So really excited about that.
Uh, tell us uh, anything outside of work uh, before we land on today's discussion. Any personal passion outside of work for you besides uh, uh, British uh, UK uh, television shows? Uh, well, but Thirty Rock <laughs> is, a, is, a, is a US show, right? Uh, um, it is indeed. Um, I knew you were going to ask that, and I, I've been thinking about that. Um, I mean, I have a long-term passion for um, uh, for long-distance running and, and open water swimming, both of which give me time to to really kind of think and decompress. Um, I don't listen to anything um, uh, other than this brilliant podcast series. Uh, I don't listen to anything when I when I when I do those things. I I, I find it really um good good downtime space. But actually, funny enough, in the last two years, I'm really passionate about. Um, and even though I grew up in the countryside in a rural environment, I'm I bored to say it wasn't until the pandemic which really opened my eyes. I'm lucky enough to my my wife and my three boys. We live in an environment where we have some green space. Um, my vegetable garden and the area behind that, which is an environment where there's lots of of, of uh, little habitats and, and my middle son particularly is very engaged in that and uh, it's an endless source of energy and enlightenment and I, I love it. It's become a complete passion for me, John. Oh, that's wonderful. I love it. I love it. Fresh farm, local farms, shop local farms. <laughs> I love it. Well, uh, awesome. Uh, I uh, Long distance running, I wasn't aware of that. I, I I wanted to check a box myself on running a marathon and I chose Boston. Why not, right? Local to Ooh. me. Um, and I chose 2018, which was the year where we had freezing and uh, about six inches of rain on the on the on the on the course. And yeah, I'll, I'll never run another marathon. That's for sure. I did finish. I crossed the finish line a lot longer than I expected. But uh, gosh, did that brutalize my body? My goodness. <laughs> Congratulations! It's, a, it's an incredible marathon. Yeah, I've not done running myself. I, I'm scared of it. The whole race, you say, you say right on Hereford, left on Boylston, and when you get there, you grow wings. I swear, uh, it's amazing. Well, outstanding. So, for our listening audience here, we we're, we're at the time here. We're going to wrap up, but Oliver, a quick uh, set of takeaways it, for anyone listening: top five ways to digitize service supply chain. Maybe if you could give like your your five key takeaways for today's listening audience. Yeah. Yes, I will. Um, number one start with your data take an honest assessment of your data don't look at it through rose tinted glasses where is your data what's good data what's bad data um, and understand how that relates to your processes secondly set your goals and that those goals are not just within your team and in your wider um, ecosystem and thinking about how internally the power structures and everything will, will will think about those goals set those goals and the expectations with them number three identify conflicts early so we've all worked in big companies where or many of us i'm sure have worked in big companies where it's regional then it's global then it's regional then it's global and decision making and then there might be decision making across different lines of businesses or verticals or products whatever it might be identify where the conflicts are going to be and get ahead of those conflicts uh, if you're going to drive a successful digital transformation number four collaborate collaborate internally collaborate externally even if you don't use someone have the conversation don't be afraid to think about things that you might not know about um, so collaboration and then five ruthlessly focus on execution um, and the quickest possible time to value right it's not about building the death star it's about time to value so those are the five data set your goals identify conflicts early collaborate and ruthlessly focus on um, time to value outstanding set of takeaways uh for our listening audience thank you for joining us he is oliver lemansky he's the ceo of on process he's a technology advisory board member of the service council his organization will be featured as well many of his customers within the context of the smarter services symposium that'll take place september 19th through the 21st in chicago right in the right near the manufacturing belt um, where we'll feature a number of keynotes that are noteworthy. You can learn more at our website. Today's podcast is available on whatever channel you subscribe to. I think there's eight or nine of them that it's accessible, whether it's Apple or Spotify or something else. Uh, and it's also accessible on the Service Council's website. Oliver, I want to thank you so much for your time. It's been really enlightening. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, John. I really appreciate the opportunity.